right, so it's 1983. I was out of school and I had no real direction. My life was quite meaningless. Uh, the experts say when a man's life lacks meaning and purpose, right, he either seeks pleasure or trouble. So I went the pleasure route. My womanizing continued. I'm all over the place with all kind of females. I was young and I felt like I had every right to run as many women as I wanted to, right? And then you, you know, go get with your little friends and talk to them, man, how was that, man? What y'all do last night? Where y'all go? And all this. And so, you know, I allowed them to just feed the sinfulness. I thought, so I was thinking it's perfectly normal, um, but it was awful. As I look back now, it was an awful time in my life. I always had a job. So I always had money. I had a great car, uh, a 1976 Mercury Capri. I was part of a car club with some cats out of Compton. And uh, we used to cruise Westwood Village on Friday night, uh, 1982, 1983. We used to have big fun. Uh, it was a beautiful car. All of our cars were beautiful. We all had Capris, but they were different colors. School bus yellow, Emron gold, blue, red. I mean, we had beautiful cars. So they attracted a lot of females everywhere we went, down on Crenshaw, again, Westwood Village. and. Uh, it just spelled more trouble for me, more entertaining females, more than ever. Started going out to nightclubs, uh, the Carolina West, uh, Paradise 24, Uncle Jam's Army, Eve After Dark. What's Eve After Dark? That's um, where Dr. Dre at 19, it's one of the first times he spin turntables out at a club. Uh, was Eve After Dark, Avalon and El Segundo. Uh, that was a big deal back then, Dr. Dre, Eve After Dark. And, um, but I'm all over the place, running with the wrong people, just, just, just screwing up my life, screwing up my young life, my 20s. Uh, well, I, I ended up, in all of my madness, meeting up with a young lady that I went to Carson High School with, uh, Ramona Fluker. And we ended up having intimate relations with each other. It, it was a one night stand, and um, as they call it, and we went our separate ways and I, I never saw her again. And I was just carrying on in my foolish, sinful ways. Um, not as a grown man, but still as a little boy. Well, recently on Saturday, April 30th, 2022, I learned something that would shock me to the core where I almost passed out. I received a message on my phone. My phone was on the desk and I asked my wife to bring it to him. I said, honey, will you bring me my phone? My dear wife, Andrea. Right? I said, will you bring me my phone? So she brought me my phone, but then she paused and she saw a message there. And it was like, uh, I got a, a text from someone. It said, hey, Michael, I really need to talk to you. Can you call me, please? Now, so now I didn't see this, you know, after the fact I've learned all this, but my wife saw it and, and she wondered, who is this messaging my husband by, by Michael when his clients call him Coach Mike? So my wife became suspicious. And so what she did, she used her phone, text the number back, pretending that she was me. And so, uh, and so th this lady left a message and it said, can we meet up? And so my wife pretended it's me. It's like, for what? And so she said, you know, you, you, I need to share something with you. You have a son. And so sure enough, uh, I mean, you got it. The person was Ramona Fluker. That's who was contacting me from 38 years ago, saying that when we got together, on, on that occasion, right, we produced a son, Sergio Marquez Jr. And uh, she sent me his photo and she sent me my photo, show me what she was looking at to put two and two together. And I'm looking side by side and it blew me away. 
because finally my wife had revealed to me everything that was happening after she discovered I wasn't out fooling around. And my wife standing next to me, when I looked at them pictures, my heart was beaten out of my chest. I had all of these different emotions at one time. I, I, I'm like just tripping out. I'm like, is someone trying to distort money from me? He can't be my, it's just, it was a thousand thoughts. Um, but after really looking at him, I'm like, man, we got the same eyes, the same smile, same cleft in our chin. And I'm like, he's my son. He would have to be. And so she ordered a DNA. I took it. Sure enough, 99.99%. He is your son. So Ramona put me in touch with Sergio and uh, she gave me his number. I was, I was sad and I was excited at the same time. Uh, I was sad because I, I, it's like, Mike, look at what your wayward recklessness did, did years and years ago and how it's affected this young man. I was sad because he, he, for 38 years of his life, he didn't know who his real father was. In fact, what blows me away is I know his real father, Sergio Marquez Sr. He was on the prom court when we were in high school. And uh, he must have been dating Ramona in high school because I believe they went to the prom together. Um, so that was like, wow, I found that out. It's like, so I've known his father my whole life. We went to high school together. What a trip. So uh, my new son and I arranged to meet at uh, Larson Steakhouse in Woodland Hills. And uh, I, again, I've never been so terrified and excited to meet another man in my life. And uh, my wife, Ani, she's, she's just been a dream through this whole thing um, because she was right there to support me and, and, and be with me. And I said, honey, will you go to the restaurant with me and film the occasion? Like I wanted it filmed. I, I wanted to, to capture this moment. For the first time in my life, I'm meeting, you know, really my oldest son. Because I have two other sons and a daughter, but Sergio's the oldest now. And I really wanted to document this historic moment. And so, um, you know, he walks in and it's like, oh man, it's, and we hug and stuff. And, and, um, and I'm looking at him and, and across from the table, we had a very nice steak dinner. Well, he ordered something else. Uh, some crab or something, something crazy stuff. He's a chef also, so he ordered something. I can't even pronounce it. He's such a sophisticated young man. And, uh, but we have a lot in common. When we smile, we look almost identical. And uh, well, my head is like 10 times bigger than his, but uh, he won prom king. I won prom king and homecoming king. He would have won homecoming king, but he was on like the, um, he told me he was on the leadership board or something and they felt like that would have been unfair if you had, we had let you win, something like that. And so, but to me, he was still homecoming king, just like his dad. Uh, but, but he's Howard educated, an entrepreneur, like I say, a chef focused on his goals. So I'm really excited to continue getting to know him. I don't wanna be pushy. Like, again, this is the first time for me. I, you know, how do I handle this, right? But I just said, give him some time. I don't wanna be pushy. I don't wanna come in and say, I'm your daddy now, and all this stuff, I no, right? It's too much time has passed for that. Plus, he loves his, his father, Sergio Marquez Sr. You know, and I respect that, but biologically, yes, he is my son. So, uh, wow, what a big shock. The biggest shock of my life to date. My son, Sergio Marquez. Yep. All right, now back to 1983-84. So I continued once again down the wrong path. I became so out of control that I went on disability. I partied even more coming in real late at night. Uh, uh, experimenting with cannabis, which of course is weed, but the sophisticated name today is cannabis.
but uh, back then it was weed and uh, it wasn't legal and it was very much frowned upon and I'm fooling around with that stuff and just running with the wrong crowd. I was so out of control, my mother said, this is what you're gonna do, son. You're gonna go back to school or you're gonna get a full-time job or you're gonna leave my house. And I was like, man, if you can't tell me, I'm a grown man, just like a young fool. And so my mom told me to leave. And I was hard headed and I packed my bags and I left, I mean, a few little things I had, got in my car, drove to the end of my street. And I'm gonna stay in the corner, I'll stay down here in the cul-de-sac, dead end, right? I'm gonna stay here, right? And so I'm kicking back in my car, kind of nodding off and a young kid, whose parents I knew, I knew their whole family. He knocked on the door, Mama wants you to come here. She want to talk to you. I was like, no, it's fine. I'll just stay in my car. She's like, Mama want to talk to you. So that was uh, Mrs. Griffin. So the Griffins let me stay in their house. They said, you can come stay here. They gave me a bedroom. If I want to eat their food, you know, I can. They, they just, it was great. They let me park my car in the garage to protect, keep people from stealing it. And I blew that opportunity also. Just a young fool. I blew that too. I ticked them off so much. They was like, you got to leave. You got to get out, right? So I said to myself, now what? What am I going to do? I'm out on the streets. What are you going to do, Mike? But the Lord was with me because there was a man that helped me turn my life around. I knew this man my whole life and uh, he was always like a father to me and he helped me turn my life around.